Enter the eerie realm of the Mothman with us. Explore chilling eyewitness accounts. Navigate through legends and unravel the mysteries of this wing phenomenon in Point Pleasant. Join us for a journey into the heart of the unknown. Ready to confront the wings of mystery? Tonight on Newsworthy. Two words, two question marks. Scoured the podcast world and finally found us. Newsworthy with Steve and Jerry, where we delve into all things mysterious, macabre, or out of this world and decide if they are truly newsworthy. Two words and two question marks. Why should you work with Ed Locke? A better question is, why wouldn't you work with him? He is a proud to support an amazing lender, USA Mortgage. When you work with them, you can expect a home financing experience that is free of hassles and headaches. They have complete control over your loan due to in-house operations such as processing, underwriting, closing, and funding. USA Mortgage represents a lot of fantastic things but they are especially thrilled to partner in several community outreach programs, including Habitat for Humanity, Home Sweet Home, Veterans Community Project, and many, many more. They love going to work every day, which means they love working for you. Ed wants to be your lender for life, so reach out to him today and get the journey started. If you would like more information, please reach out to Edlock at area code 502 960 NMLS 448-908, USA Mortgage NMLS 227-262. USA Mortgage is an equal housing lender. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions may apply. For licensing information, go to www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Hello, gentlemen. Happy hello, hello, hello. hello. early Wednesday. Oh, yeah. Hey. I, I tell you what. What? My back is looking so much prettier. Oh, man. Look at this hair that he's got braided, Jerry. Look at that. <laughs> I'm I've never seen such greatly braided back hair in it my was life. Wonderful. I was, I was, you know, after listening to that episode last week, I was, I was really regretting not rescheduling, but, you know, I, I think... After looking at it in the mirror, it's it's it was definitely yeah they did a good job. I'm I'm really I'm I'm really shocked that someone has that much back hair that's not been like uh, considered yeti at some point. (laughs) Yeah, the bigfoot that you all hear about that's that's actually me. (laughs) No, I wish I had back hair. Wow, that's crazy. A few days before Christmas, you guys ready? Oh yeah. Well, um. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I just want to say I'm going to put it out there for real quick If you don't care, just a sec Sure, go ahead Um, If you're listening to this We're going to release this episode Wednesday It's actually Tuesday Tomorrow I have to have Hopefully my final surgery To get rid of this cancer Um, F cancer Okay, first of all Big time (laughs) Let me just put it out there that way Um, And How do I say this? So, like, if you've ever had or develop in the future cancer, and it seems like I never dealt with it much until I had it, and now everybody I know has it, and it's, like, weird, and I hate it. Um, Everybody's experience, even if they have the same cancer that you have, is different. We went to this uh, thing uh, and I don't want to get too into it, but I listened for 20 minutes while this lady told me about how non-bad my cancer is. And I agree, you know, I am, as far as cancer goes, I'm very blessed. I have one of the most curable kinds that you could possibly get. Okay. I'm aware of this, but that doesn't diminish my fight with it just because Absolutely. she thinks 
it's this. Yeah. It doesn't diminish how I believe. And, you know, fortunately for her, she had a very small, she didn't have, the, it hadn't spread like it has with me. And, you know, and I'm not trying to say, oh, mine's worse than hers. That's not what I'm trying to do. I just. It's still think, cancer. Like. Just, just <laughs> think before you speak. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because um, everybody deals with, I'm a very positive person. So it didn't really affect me that much. Okay. I, I, you know, regardless of what happens, I know I've got this and God's got me, right? So even if the worst case scenario, I'm okay. But everybody deals with that differently. And if you don't know that person very well, you're not sure how they're going to react to that. And I can speak from a to you know, from from the other side of it now that I just wanted that woman to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I'm sure. I mean, she. Granted, she was just trying to be empathetic. You know, she really didn't know what to say. And positive. She's probably trying to... But everybody's struggle is different with oh, this sure. disease, even yeah, if you have the same kind of disease. Well, and like, like you said, when when you first... Just hearing the C word. Yeah. In, in any context, no matter if it's a curable cancer or an uncurable cancer, you know, you spread your type... The you surgery's know, still real. Recovery yeah. still sucks. Right. It, um, radiation not, still blows. Right. It, um, it's not a. It's not something to take lightly in any, in any circumstance whatsoever. So I just want to, and I don't mean to take over the whole podcast with that. No, no. But I, it just needs to be said. You know, I, people who are uh, survivors or dealing with cancer. You know, it took my father, ex father in law, last week. Um, I've got uh, close family members that are fighting much worse type cancers than I have. Um, I've got good friends that I love dearly that are um, getting ready to take ungodly amounts of chemotherapy over the night and are going to miss two months of work. Um, so I'm not saying don't have empathy and don't care for these people, but just please mind your words. Yeah. You know, because, because you may have experienced something or feel a certain way towards something doesn't mean that their psyche and where they're at in their battle sure. can handle what you're about to say, if that makes sense. It does. Um, Absolutely. But ultimately, I just want to take that minute and say F cancer. <laughs> something you said a minute ago about God's got me reminded me. Have you ever heard that there's a gospel song called I'm a winner either way? Have you ever heard the song? I have. I love Beautiful. it. Beautiful song. If I stay or if I go, I'm a winner either way. Right. So anyway, uh, now back to what we're talking. Man, we got a f fun topic today. But you know, Brett, you'd be so proud of me, Brett. So proud. Because um, I've been doing something and learning about something that you find very amazing. You and my son Joshua, both. Bring him back here. Huh? Oh, man. <laughs> Math, dude. Now, see, I can tolerate algebra. Maybe even a little calculus. Used to do that when I drove the truck. Oh, yeah. But you know graphing? That's where I draw the line. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> 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 nice. Yeah. Well, speaking of, you said he'd be proud of you. I yeah. Think. Hopefully, both of you would be proud of me. Oh, oh, did you grow some more fruit, Jerry? No, no, <laughs> just, just the two. Oh, okay. That's all it takes for a pair, right? Right. <laughs> but I did just finish a book that I've been uh, working on. Oh, really? I wrote a book on penguins. Oh. Although, come to think of it, paper would have been a far better choice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but I was hoping you guys would just be... Proud of the fact I finished the book. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I so broke. This week was a pretty big week. So I, first time ever, I got to ride in a Tesla. No. Nice. Oh. Luxury. Let me tell you. Luxury. But one thing I was kind of disappointed at, Teslas don't have the new car smell. Really? Yeah. Yeah, they, they have an Elon Musk. Oh, oh gosh. I don't know wow. why I smell that one. <laughs> Oh, Joe, wow. Oh, I thought mine was that. bad. That, that was bad. <laughs> Maybe Ooh. I should have went with the other one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I thought it was a perfect dad joke. Topic. Um, a little bit different. A little different, for sure. Um, 
One thing we don't cover, this is going to be one that we may end up revisiting next September, right? Could be. <laughs> I, I kind of hope so at this Could point. Because be. this is so close to home that it's almost, we almost have to revisit it. Was like three hour drive? It's only a three hour drive. Yeah, not far. And as soon as spring comes, I'm going to go up on my bike and just scope it out and see. Oh, yeah? Because it'll be a fun ride on my bike. I think we'll tease them enough. Let's at least tell them. Just Tonight? Don't, don't watch the uh, wrong turn before you do that. <laughs> Tonight we're going to talk about the Mothman of West Virginia. That's right. From Point Pleasant, West Virginia, the border between the Ohio River separates uh, Ohio, farm West Virginia. Yeah, it's not that far from us at all. Yeah, and uh, so Mothman is a crazy cryptid. Uh, most accounts... Uh, Six, seven, eight feet tall, big, huge wings, boiling red eyes, about as scary as you can possibly get. Uh, if it had braided back hair, we would just attribute that to Brett. But, uh, <laughs> Let me interrupt for one second. Sure. If there is people out there like Brett and I, who before Steve suggested this, had never heard of Mothman, yeah. and neither of us had heard of cryptids. There may be other people out there that don't know what they are. Sure, sure, sure. A cryptid is a creature or animal that is said to exist in the wild, but whose existence is disputed or unsubstantiated by science. So, yeah, there is no absolute proof, which is what I was getting to earlier. But at least now you know what the word means that we brought up a few times. That's Absolutely. Right. Sorry Absolutely. to interrupt. And that would encompass Bigfoot, Yeti, Mothman, Nessie, uh, Chupacabra, uh, the... Uh, swamp guy down in New Orleans, whatever his name was, uh, I forget. But, yeah, anything of any size that is of intel. I'll get to that in a second. When you were talking about the cryptids, I went to uh, Wikipedia has an article on a list of cryptids. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. I was hoping they would number it, but they don't. But, yeah, it's a long, long list. I'm down at the end. Let's go back up. Yowie, Yeti. Urine, Skunk Ape, Orang Pendek, Honey <laughs> Island Swamp Monster, Gray Alien. Hmm. I wouldn't have thought that would have been encrypted, but yeah, they're throwing aliens. Yeah, I, guys, it, the list goes on and on. Cryptids are a... Uh, yeah, there's a long list of those. <laughs> What'd you find so funny? Nothing. Hello. All right, so with the cryptids, I... So I guess they're always humanoid in some fat form or fashion? I don't think, no, no absolutely not. Nessie certainly is Well, not. I guess, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, uh, yeah. Absolutely does not <coughs> yeah, you're right. have to be at all. Uh, but yeah, the Mothman, a humanoid creature that first was seen in the uh, 1967 in the Point Pleasant, West Virginia area between November 15th of 1966 and December 15th of 1967. The first newspaper report that was published came out dated November 16th, 1966, and it was titled, and I quote, Couples, plural, couples, see man-sized bird, dot, 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 creature, dot, 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 something, end quote. So, originally they they were saying it was man-sized, they were saying it was a Animal of some sort, a bird, a creature. Again, bird, creature, or something. Now, the National Press was quickly picking up these reports, and the story rapidly spread across the United States. And uh, it wasn't until the, the 70s when it began to get an even larger audience, and that was when a couple of books that I think Brett's going to talk about a little bit uh, later on came out. Um but yeah, on November 15, 1966, there were a couple of, two young couples in a car, double date maybe, young, what were they, 18, 19, 20, somewhere around there, I think. Right, yeah. Young, two young couples. And uh, they told police that they'd saw a large black creature with glowing red eyes. That's where this basically started from. Uh, yeah, large black creature with eyes glowing red standing at the side of the road. Uh, the name. The name is sort of an enigma. We don't really know where it come from. At the time, Batman was a very popular TV series. Now, the villain... 
Killer Moth was never on the show, but he did appear in the comic book series. And many believe that this influenced the media to come up with the, the term Mothman that was used for this creature. Um, he got pretty famous when a bridge that separated uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia from Ohio, the Silver Bridge, it was an Ibar chain suspension bridge. It was built in 1928, and it was the bridge that carried the U.S. Route 35 over the Ohio River and connected the two cities. Uh, on December 15th of 1967, it collapsed amid rush hour traffic, resulted in the deaths of 46 people, and somehow or another, poor Mr. Mothman got blamed for that. He got blamed for the destruction of the bridge and the death of 46 people. Yes, Steve. Oh, I didn't. Just keep going. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I've got a little more to add to it before at the end. Brett, yeah. take over and tell us what you got. <clears throat> so, just talking about those books that came out. So, in my research, so the, the first one that I that really stood out was in 1970, Gray Barker, who was known for other books, you know, on UF UFOs and other conspiracy theories, wrote evidence indicates that he was skeptical of most UFO claims and mainly wrote about paranormal for paranormal events for financial gain. So this guy was very much discredited later on in his life. Um, and while this this book definitely increased the enthusiasm and the following of the Mothman. It doesn't seem like it's something that is very credible. Um, you said it, he was discredited. How so? So, it, so, so I got my, I got that source from Wikipedia and they referenced the Skeptical Inquirer um, and it, specifically the May, June 2002 issue of that where the journalist John C. Sherwood um, who is a uh, a business associate of, of researcher Gray Barker published an analysis of the private letters between um, uh, John Keel, who I hadn't mentioned yet, and Barker during a period of uh, Keel's investigation where, uh, so in 1975, John Keel wrote The Mothman Prophecies, which is probably the most famous book on the Mothman, which basically combined the accounts of the Mothman sightings with uh, John Keel's theories on UFOs. So, um, Basically, he he had, he had basically said that the Mothman was some sort of um, holographic uh, rendering done by UFOs, um, it, and, and like I said, after the issue of the Skeptical Inquirer, it seems like both Gray Barker and John Keel have been somewhat discredited. Um, so it's it's hard to to take what they say. To be truth, um, that I, I will say, John Keel, his book did lead to a movie that was made in 2002 called *The Mothman Prophecies*, which was the same name as the book, star, starring uh, Richard Gre Richard Greer. Gear or Gear, sorry. Um, and you know, it had some sort of cult following, but um, nothing more than that. It was very loosely based on the book. So, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, what was you going to do? Ask if you need the charger. Oh! <laughs> no, no, not yet. Good old laptops. <laughs> yeah, man, we're, we're, we're bouncing around here tonight. We're trying to figure it out. Uh, so, according to the book, yeah. everything's fabricated. What about the uh, four eyewitness accounts of the four couples? Yeah, so... That's something I definitely wanted to get into. So, so we got Roger Scar Scarberry, Linda Scarberry, Steve Mallet, and Mary Mallet. So, obviously, Roger and Linda are married. Steve and Mary are married at the time. So, it honestly, in, in my research, I'm not sure if anybody else was able to find anything else in their research, but Linda was definitely the most. Um, she definitely had the most information about her. Uh, versus the rest of the group. And that was mostly due to the fact that she was the only one willing to interview. Um, all the other three were not willing to interview after this incident. Um, so Roger was 18 at the time of the incident. 
Linda was 19 at the time of the incident. All, all four of them attended Point Pleasant High School uh, with each other, which is how they became friends. Um, and it is said that Roger and Linda had many conversations with the author, John Keel, that led to his book, The Mothman Prophecy. Uh, so a couple of descriptions that, that Linda had said about the Mothman was she described the creature as slender, muscular man, about seven feet tall with white wings, and said that she was unable to discern its face due to the hypnotic effect of its eyes. Um, the couple, so Roger and Linda, they, they were said to experience a lot of uh, strange occurrences and poltergeist activity throughout 1966 and 1967. Wait a um, minute. They say that one again now? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, Linda and Roger... Easy had, for you to say. Right. ...had said that they had seen <laughs> other strange occurrences and poltergeist activity throughout 1966 and 1967. And, yes, we, we got to get to that at the end, maybe. But, but so, they 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 have seen other strange and weird images. Yeah, Linda claimed to have seen this creature, the Mothman, many times, including once on the roof. But she had said that she had thought the creature was just there to communicate. She didn't ever feel in any sort of danger. Um, and actually, in September 12th, uh, 2001, there was a documentary called Search for the Mothman, and they interviewed Linda uh, on location. Uh, they were able to get her for 10 minutes, but she had to stop because she became so overwhelmed by fear to go any further in the interview. Um, so... Her ex, so at that point, she, her ex husband Roger and the Mallets refused to be interviewed. So, again, Linda was really the only one that ever, um, that ever had interviewed talking about this incident after the fact. Um, and Linda actually died in 2011. One thing that Jerry didn't cover that I, that I thought was uh, pretty interesting and, and was covered by multiple sources was this character in the story called Bandit. And Bandit was not human. He was a German Shepherd. Oh. And this German Shepherd Bandit, uh, he lived, he, he belonged to Newell Partridge uh, in Salem, West Virginia. Um, this book, this, this account was chronicled in John Kill's book, The Mothman Prophecies. Um, and it basically said, it, so basically this dog Bandit with, had gone into the woods um, after two glowing red circles. Um, Partridge said he looked for Bandit, but found nothing but paw prints going in a circle that then vanished. So, this was, and this was something that even the Smithsonian had quoted as, um, you know, a, a credible story. A couple other characters in this, uh, such as the Sheriff, the sheriff of uh, Mason County, George Johnson. So he believed that the sightings were due to himself. I don't even know why. Oh, man. So one of the things that we've talked about on this, on this show many, many times is the attraction of UFOs to our nuclear weapons and nuclear sites. Guess what happens to be right up the street from Springfield, West Virginia? Um, Roswell. <laughs> No. You said yes. Okay, well, you were wrong. <laughs> and congratulations. So, just right up the road, one of the only radioactive fracking waste cleanup factories is right up the road. Um, and this place is now shuttered. It was a nightmare. It yeah, was. I guess I didn't. We didn't. We talked about this a little bit before the show, but I. Yeah, so yeah, I guess that a place that place still exists. It does still exist, and it's just sitting there doing nothing. It's considered West Virginia's Chernobyl. It was that bad. It was that badly wow. constructed. It was that badly ran, and that's why it's no longer operation. Does it still contain nuclear waste? Um, it is not, but it is still uh, radioactive. Right. Because, yeah. So, and here's the thing. If you live in Pittsburgh, this should concern you because this is right up river from your water sources. <laughs> just, just pointing it out there. Good Pittsburgh. luck, Pittsburgh. <laughs> Maybe now we know what's wrong with the Steelers. Oh my gosh, <laughs> he went there. Uh, there's a oh, lot the of Steelers, Steelers fans. Of this. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. I like the Steelers. <laughs> anyway, um, but let's take it back a few hundred years earlier, shall we? Let's talk about Chief Cornstalk. <laughs> and there Jerry goes. He's gone. Um, so Chief Cornstalk was a chief of the meat. What, what is it? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> How do you do that? How do you go do from what? being completely broken to, I'm sorry, what? I can't do that. I can't make that transition like you I can. have no idea what you're referring to. <laughs> no. <laughs> So Chief Cornstalk was the chief of a Minnichochi Minkochi Minkochi Minkochi. There we go. There you go. Uh, tribe, and he that was a Shawnee. That was part of the Shawnee uh, uh, group of Indians, and they were at war with uh, the colonials at the time. And we're talking. He lived back in. Pfft, 1777, back in this time. And he fought the colonials to a draw. Uh, the chief cornstalk and the leader slash mayor of the town at the time uh, earned each other's respect. They actually became decent friends um, over time. Fast forward just a little while, the British tried to recruit the Shawnee against the Colonials. Um, Chief Cornstalk came to the mayor and said, hey, look, this is what's going on. The English just tried to recruit us to attack you. Uh, there was a lot of black, bad blood still within the town. They arrested the, the chief and his son and two other braves. And before the mayor could stop them, people hung him and his son. And before he died, he said, you hang, I came here as your friend, and you're you're killing me, basically. I and with my son, we cursed this land for two hundred years. So, way back then, we have a curse on this particular area. Fast forward, he was yeah. created and housed for World War Two. Yeah. Um. So lots going on in this little little bitty area. Uh. That. You have nuclear waste, you have TNT waste and disposal, you have a curse. Um, all of that could equal the Mothman. I'm just saying. Now, here, here's it, I, so one thing that I will go against this story is that, so, again, um, Linda Scarberry was, again, the most descriptive, of descriptive source of, all, of this entire incident. Yes. And she said that she was not scared of this Mothman. She did not she think that... Was, she she kind of tried to ride the fence, but because later on, remember, at the, a few years later, she was scared to talk more than 10 minutes. Right, right. yeah, it, it's weird. It's, it's a Were weird, you scared or not? It's a weird, yeah. At the time, she also said that they were in their car when they first saw it and tried to get and, and, out of there and right. were scared then. Right. It, it's, but, it's a weird It's a weird thing where, yeah, it, she's she's saying that Oh well, the Mothman's just trying to communicate, but also like she's scared to talk of it, and the other three are not one to talk about it at all. So it's 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 a very weird scenario, and where you say the two hundred years, you know it it seems like the in this area the Mothman appearances stopped in nineteen sixty seven when the the Silver Bridge collapsed. <laughs> uh, right. So. And when when did you say that year was? Was it seventeen seventy seven? Seventeen seventy seven. That's so, when. So that would have been another ten years after this. Yeah. Um, also, just wanted to point it out that no one in West Virginia believed Mothman collapsed the bridge. They believed that was a war. He was warning against the bridge collapse. Gotcha. Okay. That was the ultimate thought. I thought I read that he was actually blamed for the forty six deaths. So I thought they thought he had contributed. I don't to think it. so. Yeah, we, 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 talk, we we talked about that, right? The the forty six deaths. And... Yeah, I briefly mentioned it. Yeah. Um, also, there are rumors, and I'm using air quotes here <laughs> because we have no actual proof of this, but that Mothman was seen around the Twin Towers and not before nine eleven. There are rumors currently that Mothman is hanging out around the O'Hara Airport in Chicago. 
Let's pray nothing happens in Chicago. But same and similar to what your witness has said, people hear communication, chirps, hums, things of an insect type. Right. I can't um, remember what, the way they described what they heard, but I, but yeah, they described hearing some sort of noise. You know what I'll think about when I when I, when I hear them try to describe it, and because we're Star Wars geeks, we'll get it. To me, it sounds like how the Geonosians would speak. <laughs> That's what I yeah, hear when yeah. I hear her trying to make those descriptions. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So made a screeching sound. They said the creature yeah. flew after their car, making a screeching sound. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and no matter in in the you know the, what is it, Chief Cornstalk? Chief I mean, Cornstalk. He he adds something to the story for sure. You know, it, I think that I think the biggest argument for the story is that four different people claim to see the exact same thing at the same time. That well, and, and and three of them had no had, did not want anything to do with the story after the fact. Even even before those four in the car, those two couples saw, there was other reports of Mothman in right, the area. The, the, the story and, of Bandit was before that. And all that of those people drew or sketched similar sightings. So could this have been a huge, like, eagle or condor? Maybe. Yeah. California condor's got a wingspan of, like, nine and a half feet. Huge bird. Is it a Mothman, though? Yeah. Like, really. like I said, this wildlife biologist said the St. Hill Crane was... <laughs> that I, want everybody, I want everybody listening to look up the St. Hill Crane. We'll put a link to a picture on the that episode. Looks well. like, if that looks like the Mothman as described, <laughs> it doesn't look like anything like the Mothman. No, no. I think that the, the max height is like four and a half feet. So it's not it's not a seven, eight foot no, being no. <laughs> by any means. A few also, days after... Oh, a few days after the initial sighting, two volunteer firemen also saw something that they described as a large bird with red eyes. Yep, on a roof. Yep. Yeah, I, I yep. saw that. I read that report. Also, in this area, around this specific time, did the name Indrid Cold come up in either of your research? No. Not at all. <laughs> But we didn't go to the site you went to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, around this time, and, and again, this is the same area. You know, if you have one person seeing something, that could be dis- described a hundred different ways. Right. Right. Um, if you have six people or eight people, as we do right now, that have all seen the same thing and sketched it out, then we have something that is not so coincidental anymore. Um, just the simple fact we have so many weird and bizarre things going on in this particular area leads me to believe that there's something. And the name and the legend of Indrid Cold just adds to that. So I just want to... So I don't think we can cover Mothman without covering Indrid Cold, same time frame. Excuse me, same area, completely different circumstance. Here's what I mean. Woodrow Darren, Darren Berger made his living selling, and this is coming from Historic Mysteries. Woodrow Darren Berger made his living selling sewing machines. November 2nd, 1966 was a long day for him. By 7 o'clock, he was driving along a hill just outside Parkersburg on Interstate 77 and was looking forward to going home. Cold, wet evening. He's driving down the road. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to skip a lot of this so we, for, for time's sake. But basically, he, was, he had just enough room in his car to drive. Um, he's driving to do, do, um, up ahead. He sees what he thinks is a, a, a patrol car and a sobriety test. You know, as much as I hate these things and Jerry thinks that literally, you know, we, we, we disagree on that, but they happen. He quickly dismissed the conclusion when he realized what he was looking at wasn't a car at all. 
Whatever this was was shaped like an old-fashioned kerosene lamp with a central bulge and flared edges. However, this thing was the size of a car, and it was sitting on the side of the road, like in the road. The door slid open, the man exited, and according to Darren Berger, this man was average in many ways. He had a deep tan, dark hair, swept back, um, and it was unusual that he had such a deep tan for this particular time of the year. The thing that struck him most was that Indrid Cold had an extraordinarily broad grin. Uh, by far, it was the most striking thing on his entire appearance. Um, basically, he said that he came from a place that was less powerful than the United States. <laughs> and he went on down and he had a conversation. And the thing is that struck Behringer most is the guy didn't actually speak. He talked to him telepathically. Um, both he, Indrid Cold, and the vehicle departed, uh, and he went away. Six more people within the next year had the same run-in in the same general area with Indrid Cold. Same type situation as with Mr. Mothman. Anyway, we'll cover Indrid Cold in a whole nother episode. The Grinning Man. The Grinning Man. So, just something else in this particular area that just makes you say... Apparently, they had some pretty good psychedelic drugs in the <laughs> or, or... What, what the, the hell? hell? <laughs> Either one. Take your pick. Take your pick. So... This is the 60s we're talking about. Yep. <laughs> the late 60s at that. Absolutely. So... What do you think about the Mothman? Now that we've kind of covered some of the facts. Yeah. yeah it, we've seen some of the pictures. This is newsworthy? Is, is this... We haven't got there yet. That? Just what do you think? We haven't got to the, the okay. question. Okay. We've got, right. we got a few minutes. I'm just... Here's, here's what I think. All right. I think, what does an area do when you've got this humanoid creature that's scaring the hell out of the public? Many believe caused a bridge to fall that caused... Kill 40 people. Well, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, what you do is you have a Mothman Festival. Every yes. year, annually. Annual event for 20-something years to start in What did you say the population was? 4,000 of the town. Right. But it's, why it, would you not? Why would you not? <laughs> why would you not? I, I mean, agree. <laughs> now, <laughs> the Mothman Festival is held every third weekend in September. They claim that people from all over the world gather to celebrate their favorite cryptid. So they've tried to market it as not only a celebration of Mothman, but all cryptids. So you're welcome to come and celebrate whatever your favorite cryptid is. I think if you come in 2024, you come and you stop by the Newsworthy. Booth. If you do, September 21st, <laughs> September 22nd, 2024 is when is it's it, going to be Is it a two-day event? Two-day event. Okay. Uh, a town of 4,000 people draws approximately 25,000 people. Wow. 25,000 people. In 2022, it generated over $2 million in revenue. They do this by having merchandise oh from various gosh. vendors, live bands, guest speakers, cosplay, and uh, many attraction and events. Don't forget while you're there to tour the Mothman Museum while you're in town. It is the only Mothman Museum in the entire world. Make sure that you have your picture taken with the famous Mothman statue that sits adjacent to the museum. Wow. So, what do I think? I, I agree with Brett. Somebody said, you know what? We could probably make some money on this. <laughs> and, I th Why would you not? But, I agree. It, it, that's, not? And that's the thing. It's like, just because they want to make money off it, does it? No. It, it's not a... It's not a discredit to I the agree. story. I don't take that as it, be saying that he was. And, you know, we we talked about this before the, the show. Uh, Patreon, again, we're we're coming for you. Uh, but but <laughs> who knows? Th here's the thing for me is four people saw the same thing at the same time. And, and four people before them and it, and saw it at different times and had the exact same description. No, 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 not exact same. <laughs> Similar enough. Well, you get you get the story of you know, Bandit the dog. It, 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 
and that that's that's a story that the the Smithsonian put out. I mean, it's, it's a credible story. It's it, it's tough. It's it's a tough one for me because <laughs> I'm, I'm on the fence. I really am on the fence with this because I think there was something there. That, I did. I don't know why. Like it, like we said before, there's there's truth to every story. Sure. A- every story has some truth to it, and I don't know what that truth is. Well, I don't think I don't think it, it's it's some sort of heron or some sort of bird. <laughs> I I don't think that. I really don't. I, and uh, yeah, this is this is a tough one. It's a tough one for me. I don't know. <laughs> I just want to point out that very recently, the you know we talked about the radioactive radioactive area that is near here in Chernobyl. There are dogs now that their DNA has been altered already by the the radiation that they've encountered. They're thriving, though. Really? Yeah. I I, I didn't know this. And there are fish in the water that have obviously had their DNA altered, but they're thriving. This would be a good episode to do. I I Um, really don't. I didn't know about this. It's insane the way life Uh, In Jurassic Park, Jeff Goldblum's character said it brilliantly. Life will find a way. Right. Regardless of what we try to do, life's going to find a way. So I agree with Jerry. They saw something. And there's all these other things that are contributing to it. Was it an eight-foot moth? I don't know. Who am I to say? If you hear my story, then... I, how am I going to argue against what this lady said she saw? But <laughs> keep in mind, she didn't say that it was a moth. No, the, no. the media did that later. Right, right. The newspaper the next morning tried to sum up what they had said, and again, the title of the newspaper was this: "Couple see man-sized bird dot 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 creature dot 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 something." This some you can't argue with that. I like the right, dot, some dot, humanoid dots. with wings. It was Basically. something. Uh, and that I cannot argue with that at all. She saw something. Didn't know what it was. If you believe, if you believe in the Bible, how many pictures of angels or demons have you seen with uh, that are humanoid with wings? <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to get religion into this, but I mean, it's not. I'm, I'm not of the mindset of just discounting this entirely. Oh, I agree. All right, so Jerry, is this? More or less? Does this need more or less coverage? Thumbs up, thumbs I, down for I you, think Jerry. We've done a pretty good job covering it. I don't know that it actually needs more. I'll take thumbs down. Thumbs down, Brett. Man, I, this is a tough. One. This is a tough one for me. I'm, I'm, let me let me go first then. Yeah, and you then go you, first. Can, you can yeah. you can piggyback on what I say because this yeah. means something in the future. Yeah, I think for the sake of us going live on location to. Point Pleasant at the next Mothman Festival. I'm going to give it a thumbs up <laughs> just so we have a reason to go and, and check it out. I will say this. I will say this. It has given me enough reason to want to go to this festival. Yeah, absolutely. I make it because it's and also it's a tough. It's a tough one. And this is a, this is one. This is not like the uh, what, what was that general or Colonel Colonel Corso? Uh, this is not. Oh, this, this oh. is not the same as this. Uh, because Philip these Corso. these four people did not get any financial gain from this. Right. In fact, you know they were afraid it was going to ruin their they, lives. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't want to talk about it. it. And that's what is keeping me like. Maybe this is there was something to this. I think. I like I said. I think there's truth to every story. I'm gonna give it a three quarters thumbs up. <laughs> I'm gonna give it a three quarters thumbs up. I want to qualify my previous answer. This particular story, I'm, I'm saying thumbs down to. The festival, I'm saying thumbs up to because it is for all cryptids, not yeah. just the Mothman. Yeah, I think it'll be a blast. I think it'll be a hoot. Yeah, I, no, I think it's going to gonna go. be awesome, yeah. So, anywho, well, guys, there you have it. We've covered the Mothman. Did we forget something? Did we, did we not cover something you want? We brought up Ingrid... Uh, the Grinning Man, Mr. Ingrid Cold. We're going to bring him up later in a different episode, I'm sure. Um, but uh, send us an email to where, Jerry? Newsworthy with Stephen Jerry at gmail.com. Man, that episode is really interesting. 
And if you'll stick around for us for just a few commercials, we have another great story to tell you. Hi, this is Ed Locke with USA Mortgage. When it comes to buying a home, the process can be overwhelming and confusing. With so many options, it can be hard to know where to start. That's why it's important to work with a certified mortgage loan originator. I have the knowledge and expertise to guide you through the process and find the best mortgage option for you. I will work with you every step of the way to ensure that you are getting the best deal possible. So if you're looking to purchase or refinance, please reach out to me at 502-680-0953. So don't take on the stress of buying a home alone. Work with me and I will make your dream a reality. Trust the professionals and make your home buying experience a positive one. MLS ID 448908, DAS Acquisition Company, LLC, doing business as USA Mortgage, MLS ID 227262. This is not a commitment to lend. Additional terms and conditions apply. USA Mortgage is equal housing opportunity. If you want us to review or rate your product on air, if you have suggestions for new episodes, awesome ghost stories, or anything else, please reach out to us. Our email address is newsworthywithstephenjerry at gmail.com. Our text number is area code 540-709-1318. And now, back to the story. Some researchers believe that an archaeological site unearthed in Tennessee may have been created by ancient Egyptians. The story of Tennessee's Egyptian temple revolves around a British biblical scholar and curator, J. Rendell Harris, who believed that the Egyptians visited America before Columbus. He speculated that Egyptians initially visited the Bahamas and eventually moved up the Gulf of Mexico and up the Mississippi and established a large colony in eastern Tennessee. Harris saw a photo in a newspaper article about an excavated site in Tennessee that he believed was an Egyptian temple due to the standing stones forming the perimeter of a square building. The story has been embellished and made mysterious, with some internet sources claiming a cover-up of ancient Egyptians in America, and that the excavation was halted when the temple was found. In 1933, the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, organized a conference with university representatives and the government agencies to plan a survey of Native American sites that would be submerged after the completion of the Norris Dam. The project was conducted by Civil Works Administration and the Federal Emergency Relief Administration funds and was supervised by William Webb, the chairman of the University of Kentucky's Department of Anthropology and Archaeology. Excavation work was carried out by students under the guidance of supervisors, and the project identified 23 different sites 29 different mounds, including 12 burial mounds, 17 mounds with prehistoric structures, and the report on the project was submitted and published by the Smithsonian as Anthology Bulletin 118. It contained many photos of the excavations, artifacts, and even skeletal remains. The Cox Mound in Tennessee was excavated in 1934 and was found to have been built and construction by a series of structures built on top of each other, forming an eight-foot mound. The mound contained 49 burials and a neatly square building made of upright red cedar post with a side roof. The building collapsed and was rebuilt twice, but some of the original cedar posts remained and were incorporated into later structures. The building contained limestone, sandstone blocks, as well as 200 irregular rocks. Although the other mounds contain standing stones, it's interesting that the features caught Harris's attention in the photo were not actually standing stones, but were instead the remnants of unearthed cedar post. A thorough investigation of the artifacts discovered in the excavation revealed that they were fairly typical of Native American objects found in the Mississippian settlements. They were active from the time period of the 1200s to the modern era. As of now, all the sites that were excavated by the TVA have been submerged for over, for over 80 years, adding more fire to the conspiratorial uh, flames. Um, and just so you know, this isn't the only place in America that Egyptian artifacts were supposedly found. 
If you want more information, Google Egyptian artifacts in the Grand Canyon. And Jerry, if you can't see the light, be the light.